This is your Anxiety Toolkit, episode number 281. Welcome to your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug. Because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Welcome back, everybody. How are you? It is a beautiful, sunny day here in California. We're actually in the middle of a heat wave. Um, It is April when I'm recording this, and it is crazy how hot it is, but I'm totally here for it. I'm liking it because I love summer. Ah, Talking about heat, let's talk about anxiety and arousal today, shall we? Did you get that little pun? (laughs) I'm just kidding, really. Today, we're talking about anxiety and arousal. I don't know why, but lately I'm in the mood to talk about things that no one really wants to talk about or that we all want to talk about and we're too afraid to talk about. So I'm just going to go there. For some reason, I'm having this strong urge with the podcast to just talk about the things that I feel like we're not talking about enough. And several of my clients actually were asking like, what resources do you have? And I have a lot of books and things that I can give people. But I was like, all right, I'm going to talk about it more. All right. So let's do it together. Before we do that, let's quickly do the review of the week. This one is from, let's see, Jess Rabon 621 They said, amazing podcast. I absolutely love everything about this podcast. I could listen to Kimberly talk all day. And her advice is absolutely amazing. I highly recommend this podcast for anyone struggling with anxiety or any mental health professionals that want to learn more. So thank you so much, Jess. And this week's I Did a Hard Thing is from Anonymous. And they say, I learned it's okay to fulfill my emotions and just allow my thoughts. And it gave me a sense of peace. Learning self-compassion is my hard thing. And I'm learning to face OCD and realize that it's not my fault. And I'm learning to manage and live my life for me like I deserve. And I refuse to let this take away my happiness. This is just so good. I talk about heat. This is seriously on fire right here. I I love so much. The truth is, self-compassion practice is probably my hard thing too. I think that me really learning how to stand up for myself, be there for myself, be tender with myself was just as hard as my eating disorder recovery and my anxiety recovery. So I really appreciate Anonymous and how they've used self-compassion as their hard thing. Okay, so let's get into the episode. All right. So let me preface the episode by we're talking about anxiety and arousal. If I could have one person on the podcast, it would be Emily Nagowski. I have been trying to get her on the podcast for a while. We will get her on eventually. However, she's off doing amazing things amazing things, Netflix specials, podcasts, documentaries. She's doing amazing things. So hopefully one day. But until then, I want to really highlight her as the genius behind a lot of these concepts. Emily Nagowski is a doctor, a psychology doctor. She is a sex educator. She has written two amazing books that, well, actually three or four, but the ones I'm referring to today is Come As You Are, It's an amazing book, but I'm actually in my hand holding the Come As You Are workbook. I strongly encourage you after you listen to this podcast episode to go and order that book. It is amazing. It's got tons of activities. It might feel weird to have the book. You can get it on Kindle if you want to have it be hidden, but it's it's so filled with amazing information. And I'm going to try and give you the pieces that I really want you to take away. And if you want more, by all means, go and get the workbook. The workbook's called The Come As You Are Workbook, A Practical Guide to the Science of Sex. 
The reason I love it is because it's so helpful for those who have anxiety. It's like she's speaking directly to us, <laughs> right? She's like, it's so helpful to sort of have this context. So here's the thing I want you to consider starting off. A lot of people who have anxiety report struggles with the arousal. We're going to talk about two different struggles that are the highlight of today. Either you have no arousal because of your anxiety, right? Or you're having arousal at particular times that concern you and confuse you and alarm you. And so you could be one or both of those camps, right? So let's first talk about those who are struggling with arousal in terms of getting aroused. So the thing I want you to think about is commonly This is true for any mental health issue too. It's true for depression, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, dissociative disorders, all of them, really. But the thing I want you to remember for no matter who you are and what your experience is, even if you have a really healthy, you know, experience of your own sexual arousal and you're feeling fine about it, we all have what's called inhibitors and exciters, right? Which... Here is an example. So an inhibitor is something that inhibits your arousal. An exciter is something that excites your arousal, right? Now, you're probably already feeling a ton of judgment here, like I shouldn't be aroused by this and I should be aroused by this. And what if I'm aroused by this and I shouldn't be and so forth. I want us to take all the judgment out of this and just look at the content of what inhibits our arousal or excites our arousal. Because... Sometimes, and I'll talk about this more, sometimes it's for reasons that don't make a lot of sense, and that's okay. Okay, so let's talk about an inhibitor, something that pumps the brakes on arousal or pleasure. Could be either. There's exciters, which are the things that like really like the gas pedal, right? Like they just really bring on arousal, bring on pleasure and so forth. So we have the content. The content may be first mental or physical. And this includes your health, your physical health. For me, I know when I am struggling with POTS, like arousal is just barely a thing, right? You're just so wiped out and you're so exhausted and your brain is foggy and it's just like nothing, right? And so that would be, uh, in my case, an inhibitor. I'm not going to talk about myself a lot here, but I was just using that as an example. So, you know, you might say your anxiety or your obsession is an inhibitor. It pumps the brakes on arousal. It sort of makes it go away. So worry is one. It could also be other physical health like headaches or tummy aches or, um, as we said before, depression. Um, It could be uh, hormone imbalances, things like that. So it's always important. Go and speak with your doctor, right? That's super important. Make sure medically everything checks out if you're noticing a dip or change in arousal that's concerning you. The other next one in terms of content that may either excite you or inhibit you is your relationship, right? If your relationship is going well, you may or may not have an increase in arousal, depending on what turns you on. If your partner smells a certain smell or stench that you don't like, that may pump the brakes. But if they smell a certain way that you do really like and you really is, is arousing to you, that may excite your arousal. It could also be the vibe of the relationship. Like a lot of people said, like at the beginning of COVID, there was like a lot of fear. So that was like really, really strong on the brakes. But then all of a sudden, No one had anything to do and there was all this spare time. So all of a sudden, you know, the vibe is like, let's, you know, that's what's happening. Now, this could be true for people who are in any partnership or it could be just you on your own too. Like there are things that will excite you and and, and inhibit your arousal if you're not in a relationship as well. And that's totally fine. This is for all relationships. There's no specific kind. Setting is another thing that may pump the brakes or hit the gas for arousal, meaning certain places, certain rooms, certain events. Did your partner do something that was turned you on? You know, it could also be going back to physical, could also depend on your menstrual cycle, right? 
people have different levels of arousal depending on different stages of their menstrual cycle. I think the same is true for men, but I don't actually have a lot of research on that, but I'm sure there are some hormonal impact for men as well. All right. There's also ludic factors, which are like fantasy, whether you have a really strong imagination that either pumps the brakes or puts the gas pedal in terms of arousal, right? It could be like where you're being touched. Sometimes there's certain areas of your body that will set off either the gas pedal or the brakes, It could be certain foreplay, you know, again, so really what I'm trying to get at here is breaking it down according to the workbook, but there is so many factors that may influence your arousal. Another one is environmental and cultural and, and shame. If arousal and the whole concept of sex was shamed or or is looked down on, or people have a certain opinion about your sexual orientation, that too can impact your gas pedal and your brakes pedal. So I want you to sort of explore this, not from a place of like pulling it apart really aggressively and critically, but really curiously and check in for yourself. What arouses me? What presses my brakes? What presses my gas? And just start to get to know that. Again, in the workbook, there's tons of worksheets for this, but you could also just consider this on your own. Um, Write it down on your own. Be aware over the next several days or weeks, just jot down in a journal, like what you're noticing. Okay. Now, before we move on, we've talked about a lot of people who are struggling with arousal and they've got a lot of inhibitors and brake pushing. There are the other camp who have a lot of gas pedal pushing. And I speak here directly to the folks who have sexual obsessions, because often if you have sexual obsessions, the fact that your sexual obsession is sexual in nature may be what sets the gas pedal off. And all of a sudden you have arousal for reasons that you don't understand that don't make sense to you or maybe go against your values. So I've got a quote that I took from the book and from the workbook of Emily Nagalski's. This is not, again, none of this is my personal stuff. I'm, I'm quoting her and citing her throughout this whole podcast. Is She says, quote, bodies do not say yes or no. They say sex related or not sex related, end quote. So let me say it again. Bodies do not say yes or no. They say sex related or not sex related. So this is where I want you to consider, and this is, I've experienced this myself, is just because something arouses you doesn't mean you, it brings you pleasure. Main point. We've got to pull the apart. Culture has led us to believe that if you feel some groinal response to something, you must love it and want more of it. An example of this is, for people with sexual obsessions, they maybe they have OCD or some other anxiety disorder, and they have an intrusive thought about a baby or an animal. Bestiality is another very common obsession with OCD, or it could be just about a person, right? It could be just about a, a person that you see in the grocery store. When you have a thought that is sex-related, Your body sometimes, because the context of it is that it's sex related, your body may get aroused. And our job, particularly if you have OCD, is not to try and figure out what that means, is not to try and resolve, like, does that mean I like it? Does that mean I'm a terrible person? What does that mean? Right. So so I want you to understand the science here to help you understand your arousal, to help you understand how you can now shift your perspective towards your body and your mind and the pleasure that you experience in the, the area of sexuality. So again, the body doesn't say yes or no. They say it's either sex related or not sex related. Here's the funny thing, and I've done this experiment with my patients before, is if you look at like a lamppost or a, it could be anything, right? You could look at the pencil you're holding and you think about, you know, and then you sort of bring to mind a sexual experience, you may notice arousal. 
again, it doesn't mean that you're now aroused by pencils or pens. It's that it was labeled as sex related. And so often your brain will naturally press the accelerator. So that's often how I educate people, particularly who are having arousal that concern it. It's the same for a lot of people who have sexual trauma, right? Is they maybe are, you know, really concerned about the fact that they do have arousal around a memory or something. And then that concerns them. What does that mean about me? And the thing to remember too is it's not your body saying yes or no. It's your body saying sex related or not sex related. And so it's important to just help remind yourself of that so that you're not responding to the content so much and getting caught up in then compulsive behaviors. A lot of my patients in the past have reported, particularly during times when they're stressed, their anxiety is really high, life is difficult, you know, any of these content we went through, is they may actually have a hard time being aroused at all. Some people have reported getting an erection and then it completely going for reasons they don't understand. And I think here it's not, we don't, we want to practice again, non-judgment instead move to curiosity is there's probably some content that impacted that, which is again, very, very normal. This is why when I'm talking with patients, I've done episodes on this in the past, and we've in fact had sex therapists on the podcast in the past, is they've said, if you've lost arousal, it doesn't mean you give up. It doesn't mean you say, oh, well, you know, that's that. What you do is you move your attention to the content that pumps the gas. And when I mean content, it's like touch, smell, the relationship, the vibe, being in touch with your body, bringing your attention to the sort of dance that you're doing, whether it's with a partner or by yourself or in whatever means that works for you. So you can bring that back. There's an amazing, another amazing book called Better Sex Through Mindfulness. And it talks a lot about bringing your attention to one or two sensations touch, smell being two, two really, really great ones. Again, if your goal is to be aroused, you might find it's very hard to be aroused because the context of that is pressure. And I don't know about you, but I don't really find pressure arousing. Some pe- some may, and again, this is where I want this to be completely judgment-free, like there's literally no right and wrong. But pressure is usually not that arousing. Pressure is not that pleasurable in many cases, particularly when it's forceful and it feels like you have to sort of perform a certain way. Again, some people are at their best in performance mode. But but I want to sort of just remind you, the more pressure you put on yourself on this idea of ending it well, it's probably going to make some anxiety. Same with like test anxiety. The more pressure you put on yourself to get an A, the more you're likely to sort of spin out with anxiety. It's really no different. So here is where I want you to catch and ask yourself, is the pressure I put on myself or is the agenda I put on myself actually pumping the brakes for me when it comes to arousal? Is me trying not to have a thought, actually, in the context of that, does that actually pump the brakes? Because I know you're trying not to have the thought so that you can be intimate in that moment and engaged in pleasure. But the act of trying not to have the thought can actually pump the brakes. I hope that makes sense, right? I want you to get really close to understanding what's going on for you Everyone's different. Some things will pump the brakes. Some things will pump the accelerator. A lot of the times, thought suppression pumps the brakes. A lot of the times, beating yourself up pumps the brakes. A lot of the time, the more like goal, like I have to do it this way, that often pumps the brakes. So keep an eye out for that. Engage in the exciters and get really mindful and present. Couple of things here. A lot, so we've talked about erections for 
you know, that's for people who struggle with that. It's also true for women or men with lubrication. Some people get really upset about the fact that there may or may not be a ton of lubrication. Again, we've been misled to believe that if you're not lubricated, you mustn't be aroused or that you mustn't want this thing or that there must be something wrong with you. And that is entirely not true. A lot of women, when we study them, they may be really engaged and and their gas pedal is going for it, but there may be no lubrication. And that doesn't mean something is wrong. In those cases, often a sex therapist or a sex educator will encourage you to use lubrication, a lubricant. Again, some people I've, I've talked to clients and they're like so ashamed of that. But I think it's important to recognize that that's just because somebody taught us that. And sadly, it's a lot to do with sort of patriarchy and that it was sort of pushed on women in particular that that meant they're like a good woman if they're really lubricated. And that's not true. Right. That's just fake, false. Not, no science has no basis in, in reality. So now we've talked about lubrication, we've talked about erection, same for orgasm. Some people get really frustrated and and disheartened that they can't reach orgasm. If for any reason you're struggling with this, please, I urge you, go and see a sex therapist. They are like the most highly trained therapists. They are so sensitive and and compassionate. And they can talk with you about this and you can target the specific things you want to work on. But orgasm is another one. If you put pressure on yourself to get there, it make, that pumps the brakes often, right? What I want you to do, and this is your homework, is don't focus on arousal. Focus on pleasure, You know, again, it's really about being in connection with your partner or yourself. As soon as you put a list of to-dos with it is often when things go wrong. Just focus on being present as much as you can. And in the moment, being aware of, ooh, move towards the exciters, the gas pedal things, right? Move away from the inhibitors. Be careful there again for those of you who have anxiety is that doesn't mean thought suppress. That doesn't mean judge your thoughts because that in and of itself is an inhibitor often. So I want to leave you with that. I'm going to in the future do a whole nother episode about talking more about sort of this idea of arousal non-concordance, which is that quote I use, like the bodies don't say yes or no, they say sex related or not sex related. So I'll do more of that in the future. But for right now, I want it to be around you exploring your relationship with arousal, understanding it, but then putting your attention on pleasure, right? Being aware of both, being mindful of both, right? Most people I know that I've talked to about this, and I'm not a sex therapist. Again, I'm getting all of this directly from the workbook, but most of the clients I've talked to about this, and we've used some worksheets and so forth, they've said, when I put all the expectations away and I just focus on this touch and this body part and this smell and this kiss or this fantasy or being really in touch with your own body. When I just make it as simple as that as and I bring it down to just engaging in what feels good, sort of use it as like a as a, um, a North Star, right? You just keep following. That feels good. Okay, that feels good. That doesn't feel so great. I'll move towards what feels good. Is moving in that direction non-judgmentally and curiously that they've had the time of their lives. And so I, I really just want to give you that gift, right? Is like focus on pleasure, right? Focus on non-judgmentally and curiously being aware of what's current and present in your senses, okay? That's all I got for you for today. I think it's enough. Do we agree? (laughs) I think it's enough, right? I could talk about this all day. Uh, To be honest, and I've said this so many times, if I had enough time, I would go back and I would become a sex therapist. It is a huge training. Sex therapists have the most intensive, extensive training and requirements, I would love to do it. But one day, I'll probably do it when I'm like 70. 
And that will be awesome. I'll be down for that for sure, right? I just love this content. And now, again, I want to be really clear. I'm not a sex therapist. And so I still have tons to learn. I still have, like, even what we've covered today, there's probably nuanced things that I could probably explain better or, you know, again, which is why I'm going to stress to you, go and check out the book, right? Like, I'm just here to try and get you, you know, I was thinking about this. Remember, I just recently did the episode on the three-day silent retreat, and I was sitting in a meditation. I remember this so clearly. I'm just going to tell you this quick story. And I was like, thinking, you know, for some reason, my mind was a little scattered this day, and something came over with me where I was like, wouldn't it be wonderful if I didn't just treat anxiety disorders, but I treated the person and the many problems that are associated with the anxiety disorder? Like, isn't that a beautiful goal? Like, isn't that so it? Because it's not just the anxiety, it's the the little tiny areas in our lives that it impacts. And that's when I like out of me, as soon as I finished the meditation, I went on to my, my um, like, I have this organization board that I use online and it was like, arousal, let's talk about pee and poop, which is an episode we recently did. Let's talk about all the things because anxiety affects it all. And we can make little changes in all these areas and little changes make slowly like you get your life back. So I hope this gives you a little bit of your sexual expression back, if I could put it into words. Not maybe not expression, but just your relationship with your body and pleasure. Okay. I love you. Thank you for staying with me for this. This was brave work you're doing. You probably had a few cringy moments. Hopefully not. Again, none of this is weird, wrong, bad. This is all human stuff. So finish up. Do again, go check out the book. Her name is Emily Nagowski. I'll leave a link in the show notes. One day we'll get her on. Um, But in the meantime, I'll hopefully just give you the science that she's so beautifully given us. Have a wonderful day. I'll talk to you soon. See you next week. Please do leave a review. It helps me so much. So if you have a few moments, I would love a review, an honest review from you. Have a good day. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.